China's top political advisory body has closed its annual session on Monday. The chairman of the CPPCC National Committee, Yu Xiangsheng, delivered a speech vowing to continue supporting the efforts to build a moderately prosperous society. We must give advices and support the development during the 13th five-year plan period, making it our major task. We will implement the five development concepts of innovation, coordination, green, openness, and sharing, focus on the issues in economic and social development, deepening reform, and boosting innovation. The annual political advisory bodies meeting is coming to an end. Let's take a look back. The session began on March the 3rd. As of 5 p.m. on March the 8th, over 5,000 proposals had been submitted, covering every corner of the Chinese society. The hottest topic this year, China's economic development plan. Over 1,700 proposals aimed at maintaining stable growth amid the economic slowdown. CPPCC members have spoken to the public about the supply-side reform the country is trying to push forth to optimize its economic structure. They've also talked about how to lift confidence during this period of new normal growth. 2016 is the starting year of China's 13th five-year plan. As members contribute ideas to advance the development goals, there was a heavy focus on quality growth. Important topics included green development and improving people's standards of living. In total, there have been five plenary sessions and over 10 group discussions. Nearly 2,000 CPPCC members attended the sessions. Well, let's get an African perspective on the two sessions so far. Luke Jordan is a specialist on China-Africa cooperation. He's joining me live from our Johannesburg studios. Luke, thank you. China and Africa enjoy close economic ties. In your view, what are the key highlights emerging from the two sessions so far that could have an impact on China and Africa's relations? Hi, good day. I would say that the principal highlight is that the steps China is taking to rebalance its economy in terms of reducing structural overcapacity in heavy industry um, were accelerated at this conference. Um, the steps were probably less than China's own economy needs, but more than perhaps commodity exporting countries or uh, many economies in Africa that are dependent on commodity exports would want. So the creation of a stabilization fund to assist in shutting down inefficient steel mills um, or particular lines in steel mills will have an impact on iron ore demand. And similarly, across a range of other measures that were announced to deal with overcapacity will have the effect of continuing to moderate demand for commodities. On the more positive side, uh, there were a number of announcements in terms of advanced manufacturing, uh, the green economy, and maintaining the shift towards consumption and services in the Chinese economy that will create new opportunities for those who can seize them in the future. On rebalancing China's economy, though, there have been uh, discussions about reforms to help adopt uh, to what has been described as China's new normal. What do African governments, though, and policymakers here on the continent need to be taking note of? Well, I think what they need to be taking note of are a couple of factors. One is the continued uh, determination of the Chinese government and key policy makers to maintain the push towards the new normal, even if that means, as it seems it will, shutting down inefficient production capacity in some of the heavy industries that have provided large sources of demand for many African countries' exports. So we saw that with the uh, state administration of state assets, SASAC, talking about merging companies and shutting down inefficient lines. Um, we saw that in the talk of setting up the job stabilization fund. We saw that in terms of talking about shifting down the material intensity of the Chinese economy. And that will have an impact for, for African economies that have had large exports to China that will impact both their, uh, the price of those commodities. We will likely see those, pri those commodities prices stay lower for longer, as well as possibly reduced volumes or continued uh, absence of growth in volumes of exports from those, those economies. So both from a sort of source of investment, mining investment, but also from a macro economy in terms of balance of payments, 
um, African policymakers and uh, economies across Africa need to start adjusting very quickly. And I think some have, have been thinking that perhaps this will be a passing phase and China might go back to some of the old means of stimulating its economy. But we heard very firmly from the People's Bank of China, from Li Keqiang, from others, that a sort of large um, liquidity stimulus that would re-stimulate that kind of investment and might lift commodities again is unlikely to happen. Um, okay. I think on the positive side, um, again, mentioning sort of the, the export opportunities, that the next five-year plan, it seems quite clear, will focus significantly on consumer, on uh, consumer goods, and on the uh, digital economy, and on um, raising the standard of living of people in many of China's cities, and that will create a number of opportunities. I would say finally, the thing to take note of is that the People's Bank of China was also quite clear that it would unlikely uh, allow further large depreciations in the RMB, which will be positive for Africa in terms of creating stability, but also means that uh, as African economies, currencies may depreciate against the dollar while the Chinese currency stays, stays firm, that African exports to China may become more competitive. Right. Uh, Luke Jordan for us there from Johannesburg. Thank you.